Welcome to Cam's Cops Our Stories, the podcast series that delves into the unseen world of policing. In this episode, we'll be discussing the force's work to prevent violence against women and girls. This is a priority area for the force and has involved a long-term behaviour change campaign and several educational projects. This includes training CCTV operators, taxi drivers, door staff and businesses in spotting the signs of predatory behaviour. It was this training that led CCTV operators to call police to the aid of a woman who was in distress in Peterborough last year after recognising the signs of a predatory man. A warning at the start of this episode that it involves discussions around sexual assaults. for joining me today to talk about violence against women and girls, CCTV operators, how they help the police, and a specific case that combines the two. Um, would you mind by starting by introducing yourselves and where you work? Shall I go first? Yeah, of course. <coughs> go ahead. Um, so DC Chris Enright um, of Thoughtwood Police Station, um, work currently in CID. And I'm DS Lewis Scott, I'm currently in SCT on uh, Sea Relief. Perfect. So... I believe it was last year where you were working together um, on a specific case that happened in Peterborough. Um, right. Would you mind just taking me through that case and, and how, how what you guys did on it? Yeah, OK. So it was April 22. Um, so the incident was a, um, a lone female. Um, so for the purpose of this, we obviously won't reveal her real name. So we'll call her Debbie. <clears throat> so Debbie had been out in a venue in Peterborough. It was in the early hours, so around sort of half two, three o'clock. She'd come out of a venue alone. Um, Her friends had gone and she was highly intoxicated. So at that time, um, the CCG operator had actually um, picked her up. um, So she was on camera, uh, say, alone, because and what sort of stirred that operator's concern was um, two males from a... Um, a relatively short distance away, constantly staring, and one in particular was sort of overly staring. Um, He then approaches her, um, starts talking to her, and then sort of before we know it, the CCTV shows she's up against a lamppost, um, almost being held, um, and then this this male puts his T-shirt over her head, um, trapping her arms almost, imagine like the fetal position, but the upper half. Um, where he decides to seriously sexually assault her. And that goes on for um, close to a minute where he um, puts his hands inside the front of her leggings. He then releases her as she pushes him away. She tries to stagger away. Um, he comes up behind her again and pins her up against a like a green, um, like a telephone electric box. Mm-hmm where the sexual assault continues. Um, He pins her up from behind and does something very similar. Um, While all this is going on, the C3 operator is already um, informed at our our control room and uniformed officers are on their way on an emergency response. And then um, the sexual assault continues where he, um, as she tries to walk away again, he basically forces her into a corner up against a brick wall where she can't get out at all and she's trapped up against a bin and and, and he then goes to pull down her trousers <clears throat> so she manages to push herself away again and just as she manages to get into a taxi um, the police turn up straight away and immediately detain the male yes. so um, yeah that was the case so um, unfortunately um, Debbie um, was so intoxicated she didn't remember a thing about it mm-hmm. so was taken back to her home address um, that night by officers um, so forensics um, in terms of um, her clothing was seized um, she gave a sort of a brief first account but it was only until the next morning when that's when I took over as the officer in charge of the case yeah. that um, I don't think she still knew the sort of the enormity of what had actually happened to her okay yeah, so um, I remember actually the day that it um, 
we had the conversation about it. I, I was working on a different um, shift. Okay. And I remember walking up the corridor and um, Chris was reviewing the evidence after the interview. And I think a decision had been made that he was going to be bailed at that point. Mm. And we had a look at the footage and I think we both kind of looked at each other and we just said, he can't be bailed. Um, we need to push for this one. Um, just just from the footage, that when you, obviously Chris explaining it, it doesn't really, the severity of it is quite, quite... Um, yeah, absolutely. Quite graphic <coughs> to watch. Yeah. Um, and I'll... I'll, I'll albeit you can't see what he is doing underneath her clothing it's very evident um, and quite force, forceful um, and we had one look at it and like I say we looked at each other and we said he, he can't be reminded and Chris straight away was was happy to stay on um, yeah, he'd already worked his full shift at that point um, and he was happy to stay on uh, as long as it took just to get this guy put away off the streets and rightly so mm-hmm. um, that was the first little hurdle um, but yeah um, as I say I couldn't, can't praise Chris enough he was just ready to go and um, crack on with the job and uh, did a fantastic one at that um, but yeah nasty job we felt so strongly with the what, the footage that had happened how serious it was that there was no other option but we needed to charge him for him to be remanded in custody mm-hmm. and then which he was and he was remanded at court and what happened at court? So um, after being remanded, um, he then um, went to his first hearing and he actually pleaded guilty. That's tough. And he was given a jail sentence, I believe? Yes, so there was some further work done around whether there was any um, further offences. Um, there were no, um, in the end, no forensic um, opportunities to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that penetration had occurred. Mm-hmm. So the the charge and the conviction for... Um, sexual assault remained and he received a year in prison I think that sort of shows the value of of the CCTV operator in the initial stance because obviously while police try to be everywhere they can't be everywhere um, and they need those eyes so uh, how valuable are are they to police? They're crucial (laughs) yeah massively I mean with this investigation it was from the, the moment she left the club um, the location where she she'd started, she came out onto the street. She walked down. It was a bit, quite a walk from where she was, yeah. to and the camera was situated on the corner, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, so she was walking towards the camera as soon as she came out, and it caught from the moment she came out to when she, he was arrested. We saw absolutely everything, and and that was the a, a massive benefit to us because there was complete continuity. There was no questions raised. You know, we we have these hurdles with CPS whereby if the camera pans to the left. We don't know what is going on at that point. You know, is she, they having some form of conversation? We don't know what's being said or what's going on. Um, but the fact we saw absolutely everything, there was no discrepancy. There was no question as to what was going on. And it helped massively. I bet there were still hurdles. We were able to get over those. Yeah. Um, but um, it just, in relation to the CCTV operators, they obviously had some concern for this female. And again, it's a, it's a massive help to us in that they're able to recognise that and keep an eye on her so that if something does happen, we're able to get those convictions and, and yeah. use it. And uh, it, it, massive, it has a massive impact on the case, just having that footage. Absolutely. And unfortunately, even though that time of night there were still members of the public around, there were, say, taxis driving past, and no one actually stopped to do anything. Yeah. And it was the intuition and, I think, experience of that CCTV operator, who I believe has been doing their job for quite a while, mm. Um, they have the experience to to pick up almost a, a vibe of um, mm. something's not quite right with this person here. Um, I think I'm just going to just monitor that person for their safety. Mm. And thank God that that operator <coughs> did because God knows what would have happened to to Debbie if that hadn't had, had happened. Yeah, I just dread to think. <clears throat> like we were saying that there was no other calls, and I think some advice for, for people out and about and obviously bearing in mind the time of night obviously other people may have been out intoxicated they may not have understood or, or really seen what was going on at that point but there was and it, it's in my mind there was a a, a, uh, a few moments within the footage where she is quite clearly pushing him away mm. and is not happy with what's going on um, when he first kind of approaches her in the street and there were people walking past at that stage there were. Um, and like I say, no other phone calls. No, mm. no, there was no, uh, no one approached. No one went to see if everything was okay. I suppose from a member of the public walking past might think they're a couple. They're having some kind Probably of spat like in the it. street, mm. um, and they just leave them to it. Because um, I suppose for someone that doesn't know these people and doesn't know what's going on, it, it's, it can be hard for some people. I suppose to walk up to complete strangers and say, "Is everything okay?" 
because they'd probably expect to be met with some form of hostility or, or, or you know, if they're, they're quite noticeably drunk, there might be some form of uh, further argument violence or they might or be, aggression. yeah, violence or aggression on, on, may move on to them. Um, but, yeah, it's massively important if people do see something that they're concerned about, even if they don't approach or they don't want to go and get involved from a distance, just, just call us and, and raise a concern because we'll come and check it out and we'll make sure everything's OK. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And, it, and you know, even if, even if they don't call us straight away, you know, there's there's other people, there's bouncers and things like that, there's people in the like that, economy yeah. who have that responsibility as well to help. Um so in terms of the CCTV operators, who, who are they? Because they're, they're not police officers, are they? No. So I know they work or have, um, or they possibly are connected to the council. Mm. Um, I believe every sort of town and city has, has that, um, I guess that, that's how they operate. Um, so at that time, um, that particular operator, yeah, I, I believe he'd worked uh, doing his job for many years. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so they're not officers, they're not they're not trained. Mm-hmm. But I know that's something that has been brought in, like you said earlier, that, that the police can't be everywhere. But um, if more and more people from partner agencies have awareness of um, concerns for um, sort of safety of members of the public, it's not just um, about women, but the main focus has been violence against women and girls um, nationally. Um, which is obviously not helped with other things happening in the media and, uh, say, other police forces. Mm -hmm. And that's why um, almost everyone has their role, Um, so not just CCV operators. I know there's other things going on with with shops and businesses where um, the government and forces are working with those um, companies to have almost like a representative in, in those locations to say if someone comes in asking for help about what to do, or what to look out for if there's a customer in that shop that is um, possibly in trouble. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they need sort of speaking to privately or the signs to look out for. Yeah, for sure. It, yeah, exactly like you said there. Obviously, violence against women and girls is a, is a false priority as well as a national one. Um, and there's obviously lots of work going on on how we tackle that. Um, obviously, this you know, the nighttime economy and that is, is quite a crucial part and, and everyone has their sort of part to play, including sort of the members of the public. What would your sort of advice be to someone who, who who does see something or maybe isn't quite sure, maybe it's not as overt as pushing, but what sort of signs can they look out for, do you think? I suppose there's a, a common sense approach around it and that if someone looks in distress or if they, you know, the, the facial expressions, their body language, um, if they're actively trying to get someone away from them, um, maybe, like I said earlier, they don't feel like they can get involved and obviously there is you know safety comes first and that invo- that includes you know that that individual safety you know if they're going to put themselves in danger I would suggest not approaching but maybe calling us from a distance being able to keep eyes on the situation um, to be able to tell us what is going on before we arrive at the scene and we have you know we have various other things we can do now we have what we call uh, we have good Sam so we can send a link to that individual's phone we can then stream what's going on they can just point their phone camera at the at the situation and we can we can record everything so we can see what they're seeing at that moment in time but again these are things that just uh, members of the public may not be aware of unless yeah. we're on the phone when they speak to the the um, call handler um they will let them know at the time it's not something that someone on the street would say oh, i'm going to call up get good sam link and mm. start streaming this it's i, I would i would suggest that if someone looks in distress and you're concerned, if you have any concerns, call it in. Because if it's nothing, at least we've then checked and we can confirm it's nothing. I'd rather someone call something in that comes to nothing than ignore it and it is something because that's when things are going to go wrong. Yeah, for sure. Okay, uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Okay, so my advice to anyone would be um, about going out, um, just making sure that you keep yourself safe. I know that as an organisation we're going into businesses and also in the, with the nighttime economy and um, making awareness for, um, say, these businesses, organisations about um, awareness of um, if anyone needs any help, anything that, um, any signs that someone is coming to a shop um, or a business, either distressed or not, and someone needs help, um, like covertly, then there are. Um, representative, representatives of these businesses and locations that will that will help you, and they're being trained to identify um, those problems and those risks and signs of members of the public, and 
I think hopefully um, things will change and women will be able to have the confidence to feel safer in the streets and to contact the police and other organisations and partner organisations to to ask for help and to be uh, to be trusted and believed. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, you, you mentioned there the, the businesses against abuse and, and that's some training that we've been delivering over the last the last few months um, at the moment north of the county, but it will be extended to the whole county. And you can find a list of the businesses who have received the training on our website. Um, and it's interesting you sort of talk about there because something can be quite sort of seem low level, um, but they do usually and, and have it be a precursor to, you know, escalations of behaviour. So I guess it's it's that sort of seeing, you know, with that sort of predatory behaviour and, yeah. and stopping it before it before it goes anywhere. Yeah. Absolutely. Definitely. Hundred percent. And unfortunately there are people out there that do go out to these places with the pure intent to find these vulnerable people and to take advantage of them. Um we've seen it in many investigations where you C C T V of individuals within the club looking for these vulnerable people, be male, female, wh- whoever. Um, and it, you can just take a split second. Like with, with spiking, your head can turn, there's something in the drink, and that's that. And it can be so quick and so dangerous. But like Chris said, the advice he gave is, is spot on. Um, just hopefully and you know, just make those little changes and just look out for each other. And, uh, Thank you for listening to Cam's Cops Our Stories. If you or someone you know has been affected by the issues raised in this episode, help and support is available. For more information, visit the Force's website, www.cams.police.uk.